Good evening, everybody. Um, it's six thirty. I think we'll we'll get started. Um, uh, thank you so much for attending this evening. My name is Ragbir Kaka. I'm one of the uh, consultants on orthopedic specialists, uh, and I'll be hosting the uh, webinar this evening. Um, we're going to be talking about the management of shoulder and elbow cycling injuries. Uh, we've got a fantastic um, faculty today to present to you uh, the full range of injuries that are associated with cycling, uh, including Mr. Ali Nurani, Professor Roger Van Reet, um, Mr. Jagwan Singh, and Kevin Cuppins. So we're a, we're a big team at Orthopaedic Specialists. We cover all aspects of orthopaedic surgery, uh, pain management, maxillofacial surgery, pediatrics, uh, spinal surgery. So we cover the full gambit. And our our ethos is to have the best uh, specialists in each of their areas, whether they're based in the UK um, or abroad. So you'll see from a lot of the faculty here, that they're not all UK based. Um, some of them are from uh, our, our neighbours across in Europe. So this is the uh, team that you can see here. We do our consulting and day case operating out of our facility um, at Harley Street Specialist Hospital. Um, it's based at, uh, on Queen Anne Street. Uh, we're very fortunate to have um, two day case theatres there and um, uh, two day case suites uh, to be able to do the full range of day case operating. And we also see our patients um, with, a, with brand new consulting rooms. Um, so if you ever want to come and see us there, visit us, look at the facilities, uh, sitting on clinics, um, come and see us do some. Come and see us do some operating. Uh, this is the facility where we would uh, host you at. We're also very fortunate to be affiliated with the London Clinic. This is where we do our complex operating, overnight stay work. Uh, we've got a fantastic setup there with uh, um, uh, access to um, the hydrotherapy pool, the physiotherapy suite, um, uh, fantastic theatres. So uh, we're very closely affiliated with the London Clinic and um, we're very lucky to do so. So um, Mr. Ali Narani requires no introduction. He's a good friend and colleague of mine. He's one of the co-founders of our orthopedic specialist group as well as the Harley Street Specialist Hospital. Um, he's a well-known upper limb surgeon uh, working out of a central London teaching hospital practice at the Royal London. And um, he's widely published in upper limb uh, conditions. We also are very fortunate to have Professor Roger Van Riet. Um, he truly is uh, internationally renowned for his shoulder and elbow work, uh, particularly around the uh, arthroscopic surgery in the elbow, as well know, known to treat in international sporting athletes, uh, both Olympic and world champions, and is heavily published in this area. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Kevin Cuppins today. He's a physiotherapist with a specialist interest in sports physiotherapy and shoulder conditions. His um, academic role is based at the, out of Antwerp University and has a PhD in chronic performance uh, related shoulder pain. He also lectures around the world and he's a member of the Pain in Motion Research Group. So thanks uh, to Kevin for taking time out to join us today. Mr. Jagwan Singh, uh, he's a contemporary of mine. Um, he's a fellowship trained upper limb and trauma surgeon. He's had um, great training out of international fellowships out of the Stedman Clinic, Harvard Shoulder Unit and the Mayo Clinic. Um, and once again, um, has a real passion for evidence-based shoulder surgery. Myself, I'm a, I'm a knee surgeon. I'm part of the orthopedic specialist um, team and um, I work with uh, Professor Wilson in managing uh, lower limb deformity and sports injuries. Um, and I'm very lucky to um, host the um, webinar today. So I, I, I run most of the webinars for orthopedic specialists. And the next one that we're gonna have is looking at chronic pain uh, it's with Dr. Stefano Palmisani. Uh, we both we both work in our NHS practice out of Guys and St Thomas's, and orth, uh, orthopedic specialists for our private practice. And I imagine a lot of you will have patients who are suffering with chronic pain, you just can't get to the bottom of, uh, or how to treat them. Um, Dr. Palmasani is a leading expert in that area, and we'll be giving a talk on this on the um, on on a webinar on the fifteenth of December. So if you follow our uh, LinkedIn pages and our Twitter accounts, uh, you'll get the links for this. And as with all of our talks, we have two CPD points, support, uh, points awarded uh, for the talks. To see what we're up to, kindly follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. 
these are all, there, these are all our Twitter handles uh, that you can take a screenshot of. And if you are having difficulty or wish to um, refer a patient in to see us, um, feel free to do so using the following links um, via telephone, email, or even through the website. This talk is being recorded and you'll be able to go through the talk again if you wish to do so on our YouTube channel. So if you YouTube orthopedic specialist, there'll be a recording of uh, tonight's talk. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Mr. Duguan Singh um, to take over and go through the uh, talks today. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to just introduce our first speaker. Ali Nurani is going to talk about shoulder injuries in cyclists. Ali works at the Royal London Hospital, which is one of the biggest trauma centers in Europe. And he sees lots of these cycling injuries. He has been involved in teaching, uh, in training, um, and also sits on the education committee of the European Shoulder Rehab. He has treated numerous professional football players and professional cyclists. He has been involved with N uh, NBA, NFL, and the World Rugby. Uh, so, Ali, over to you. There we go. Always remember to unmute yourself before you share your slides. Well, good evening, guys. Thanks for joining us. Um, as you know, today we're going to talk about upper limb cycling injuries. Um, there's a lot to talk about, so we thought we'd concentrate mainly on the shoulder and elbow injuries. Um, I could talk about this for days, right? Uh, a significant proportion of my NHS and private work is actually cycling injuries. Um, and the number goes up to 30, 40%. London is even now a fairly dangerous place to cycle. Um, so quite a few experience of treating cycling injuries. So today I'm gonna to share you a brief thing about some of the common shoulder injuries and, and my kind of uh, thoughts on how I manage them. So you gotta remember that, you know, the, as far as, you know, patients injuries are concerned, uh, trauma can happen at relatively any age, right? So cycling injuries in and around London where we live are basically present at all ages because there are all ages who are actually cycling. Um, what sort of injuries do they get, right? So my experience has been that, you know, there are three different kinds of cyclists that we tend to get uh, in my practice, right? Those ones that are really, really professional athletes, some of them have the proper grip on shoes so that the feet are caught in. Um, they don't tend to let go of the handlebars and they tend to often fall on their shoulders. So you tend to get a lot of shoulder, ACJ, clavicle injuries. Then there's a second kind of cycling injury that kind of lets go and falls on their outstretched hand. Those often result in elbow and hand and wrist scaphoid injuries, distal radius fractures, radial head fractures. And unfortunately, there is a third group, the Boris bike ones that are very, very timid and they kind of hide behind a big bus on the inside lane. And they unfortunately have really, really severe injuries. So if you work in a major trauma center, you end up seeing all sorts of cyclists. Um, Today, we are gonna to concentrate on the elbow and the shoulder. And as far as the shoulder is concerned, I'm gonna talk about ACJ and clavicle fractures, which are the most commonest things that I see in cyclists. Although you end up seeing lots of other things as well, like scapular fractures. So here's what happens. You get thrown off the bike. Now, if you see this guy, you know, you can just imagine how he's gonna land, right? Now, if he lands on his shoulder, he's probably going to break his clavicle or disrupt his ACJ. But if he lands on his hand, then he might injure his hand, scaphoid, wrist, or he might actually injure something at the elbow. So the typical mechanism for cyclist falling is like this. And this picture is actually quite interesting. What you're seeing here is that his feet are still clamped on, right? And he's landing directly on his shoulder. So there's a fall on the tip of the shoulder that results in the typical ACJ 
dislocation or the clavicle fracture. So here's a demonstration of how you would want to do that. Right? Luckily, she landed in water, right? So hopefully, she didn't have any significant injuries. So the typical cyclist is like this. He's going around and suddenly you fall on the tip of the shoulder. The mechanism is pretty unique, actually. So what happens? Well, when you land on the side of your shoulders, the force is directed right towards your chromium and the ACJ. And yes, rarely the acromium is the weakest link and you may fracture your acromium. But quite often, either the clavicle breaks or the ACJ dislocates depending on which the weakest link is. So talking about ACJ separations, we know that um, they're common, right? The prevalence of type three is, you know, about 15 per 100,000. And incidence depends on activity. So we see them in professional rugby players, a very common way to injure your shoulder, i.e. fall on your shoulder while playing rugby. But if you are in a certain population where there are lots and lots of cyclists and the safety is still an issue on the roads, you end up seeing disproportionately huge number of cyclists falling and hurting their shoulders. In London, for example, if you are somebody who cycles every day it is very likely that every seven years you'll have a significant injury like an ACJ disruption or a clavicle fracture. So this is what it looks like, right? So you can see on the right side of this patient, the clavicle is slightly higher. And on the left side, it looks normal. An ACJ disruption here. Now Rockwood has classified this and um, into uh, six different types. So type one is where you have a sprain of the joint. Type two is you have some disruption of the AC ligaments. And these are often treated non-surgically and need some rest in non steroidals Skipping type three, going to type four. Type four is apparently something that goes backwards. Type five is something that goes above, right? And is above, you know, 100% dislocation. And type six, I've never seen it, but apparently it exists, is where it goes inferiorly. Now type three is the controversial one where you have the ligaments that are torn, the CC ligaments, as well as the AC ligaments are both torn, but the controversy remains apparently whether you fix them or not. So generally speaking with one and two types, you do nothing, but you may have to address the ACJ pain later if they have it. Four to five, we've tend to fix it, but three are true threes, Usually it's non-op initially, but if you are elite sportsman or a contact sport, then we tend to fix them. And six, I've never seen it, but apparently there are some that have been done. So the approaches to fixing type threes, whether we fix them or not, depends on um, the patient um, factors as well. For example, if somebody really relies on the shoulder girdle for lifting heavy stuff and so on, so at elite athletes, heavy laborers and so on, um, we tend to fix them. But quite a few of them um, that are, you know, have more sedentary lifestyle and so on, we may elect to watch them and see what happens before offering surgery. So here's a, a X-ray of a typical grade five dislocation. The, the clavicle is at least 100% or more dislocated superiorly. But something like this can be a little bit more controversial. This may look like a normal x-ray, but actually isn't. So the patient has ACJ injury. And if you just look at the alignment of it, you can now detect that the clavicle is slightly superior to the acromion. So the problem is that the classifications were devised when we only had x-rays. So when you only have x-rays 40, 50 years ago, you depend on x-rays to devise classifications. But in my opinion, the classification is actually flawed. The clavicle often doesn't just go up or backwards. It's actually not a linear deformity. It's actually a three-dimensional rotational deformity. 
x-rays can often misguide you because if you actually support your elbow you can reduce your clavicle and sometimes even something that looks pretty bad can be fairly stable so i don't rely on the x-rays to figure out whether i should fix somebody's clavicle or not and a clinical examination is very very important in decision making now, as far as the grading is concerned grade four or five in my opinion is actually probably the same injury you gotta remember that the clavicle is the only bony and piece of anatomy that connects your shoulder girdle to the rest of your skeleton so you're if you disrupt your acj you're effectively disconnecting your arm and the only bony attachment it has to the rest of your body so it's not the clavicle going up but it's actually the shoulder falling away and it just doesn't fall away in a linear pattern so often what we see is the clavicle will appear to go backwards and upwards so four and five is what actually happens together rather than in isolation So I often say to my trainees that it's actually not a clavicle injury. It's actually the disassociation of your scapula and your shoulder girdle from the clavicle. And once you start thinking that way, you actually start taking it a bit more seriously. So you can have sometimes what's called a sick scapula syndrome, where the clavicle dislocates and your whole shoulder girdle falls away. So what you end up happening is your scapula malpositions. it actually tilts so that your inferior medial scapula uh, wings out you get impingement in the front from the coracoid pain and you can get a lot of dyskinesia of the scapula as well now here is a 3d reconstruction of one of my patients demonstrating that you can have both 4 and 5 together So if you look at the left of the patient which is on the right of the screen that's normal. So a top view is looking from the front and the bottom picture is looking from the top and you can see that the clavicle perfectly lines up with the acromion and the AC joint is not disrupted. But if you look at the right side of the patient i.e. the left of the screen you'll see that on the top view the clavicle has gone up and the bottom view the clavicle has gone backwards and this is what often happens in an unstable acj dislocation so here's a typical example of what it may look like right so you have something that has gone up on the left hand side of the picture and something that has gone backwards a 4 and 5 together and this on the table this is what you will see something that has gone upwards and backwards but sometimes it can be quite subtle so when you look at this the alignment actually looks normal if you look at it the norm is completely normal but this patient has acj instability so if you just relied on the x-ray this will misguide you on how best to treat this patient this patient had been treated conservatively and came to me for a acj instability problem now what i did was to demonstrate to you i've taken his right shoulder which is normal and you can see the alignment is perfect but what you notice about the left shoulder which is on the right side of the screen is though that although the alignment is normal the clavicle is actually rotated so there is some rotational instability here The MRI scan of this gentleman looked pretty normal, right? There was some high signal around the ACJ, but the ligaments appeared to be normal. But clinically, there was a lot of instability. And on the table, I'll demonstrate this. So the same chap. Translation here on the left side. Do that again for me. You can see that I can really move his shoulder girdle backwards and forwards. Quite a bit of movement in the anterior posterior direction, and there is movement in the superior and inferior direction as well so that is a really unstable clavicle so my take on this is very simple don't judge the x-rays or even 3d cts and so on examine the patient 
because all that matters is not the Rockwood classification, but if the AC joint is symptomatic or not, and if it's stable or not. So if you have somebody who has symptoms from the ACJ and clinical examination reveals that there is significant instability here, then that is something that I would fix. So always examine the patient. Now, generally speaking, acute injuries, um, there's a lot of potential for natural healing of the periosteals, uh, avulsion of the ligaments. So all you need to do is stabilize. But once you go beyond six weeks, you have to have some kind of reconstruction. So either an autograft, allograft, or a synthetic ligament to augment it. There are lots of different ways to do surgical treatment, but the take home message is that to keep any joint stable, you have to control the ligaments. So you have to repair the ligaments if you need to. You have to repair the capsule. Don't resect the um, end of the clavicle because it provides a lot of anterior posterior uh, instability. Uh, so I don't tend to resect the um, end of the clavicle uh, because it's important from a stabilizing point of view. And I always take my time in repairing the deltotrapezial fascia and the muscles around it because dynamic stability is very, very important for a joint as well. And if it's a chronic injury, you do all of that, but you just augment with the ligaments as well. So to touch briefly upon the other kind of injuries that you get, i.e. clavicle injury. The principles of treating is exactly the same. Again, the clavicle injury is not the clavicle fracture as such, is actually what happens to the rest of the shoulder girdle. So when we look at this x-ray, what we immediately see is this clavicle is up in the air and pointing away. But actually what has actually happened is the rest of the shoulder is fallen away. So it's quite a significant injury. And we can do quite fancy 3D reconstructions to see how to plan the surgical intervention. Uh, and this is a demonstration of one of them. Uh, we Sometimes we have polytrauma patients, so we have to get the CD scans and we can do some fancy 3D reconstructions. In the end, all you have to do is stabilize it to the right length and rotation. Um, and this is a demonstration of the same patient. So my final take on management of ACJ dislocation and the clavicle fractures is there are lots of patient factors, work demand, athletes, and so on. Please treat this as not an ACJ disruption of a clavicle fracture, but think about what's happening to the shoulder girdle. These patients have scapular dyskinesia, pain, plexus traction, and so on. So these things have to be taken into account whether we're deciding whether to fix or not. And unless it's a fracture, there's often no immediate rush to go and do an ACJ fixation. So in acute cases, you know, uh, for ACJ disruptions, I tend to rehab them, see how they are. And if they are unstable, I have three or four weeks to make a decision. If somebody presents with me with a chronic injury, I tend to rehab them first because reconstruction is a slightly bigger deal. So if they fail rehab, then I tend to fix the chronic ones. And like I said, in my practice, um, I have uh, patients coming in pretty much every week with cycling injuries. Uh, and these are the most grateful patients once you get them back to um, um, their, their activities. Um, and you know, this group is particularly important because within this cycling group, I think I've treated four or five patients that have had shoulder injuries. Um, so they often send their patients to me because somebody else in their group has been treated. So with that, I thank you for your time, um, and I'll um, ask Jazz to uh, Jack to introduce the next speaker, which is Roger. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ali. Um, we can take the questions later on. I mean, if there anybody has got questions, just put them on the chat, and we'll try to answer them. Now, it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Roger Van Reed. He's based at the University of Antwerp, and he's one of the world-leading elbow surgeons, has pioneered numerous elbow surgery procedures. His yearly practice is about 900 elbow surgeries, which by far I think is the maximum number in the world, or maybe one of the, one of the most numbers in the world. He has treated elite athletes, professionals. Uh, he has published about 100 papers, 50 book chapters, and he teaches uh, fondly on most of the um, elbow courses around the world and has been um, 
the uh, one of the president, past president of the Belgian Children Elbow Society. So I'll hand over the podium to Roger. Thanks, Jack. I'm here. I didn't forget to unmute. So thank you for the uh, thank you for the kind introduction. I, I always feel tired when people read out the list of the things I've done. Um, so talking about cycling injuries is uh, something very very close to my heart, and we'll uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, I do have a disclosure. I'm a consultant with Acumet, um, uh, and some of the products will be shown. And I'm a designer of the uh, Exo Elbow Brace by uh, Jake Design, which is a temporary mobilizer post op. This is me a long, long time ago, 30 years ago almost. Um, and although I didn't make it as a professional cyclist, I do have a nice uh, curriculum with, with, with regards to injuries. Uh, clavicle fracture twice with uh, plating twice, um, olecranon fracture with uh, tension band wiring, and then also fracture my radial head twice. So uh, needless to say, most of the injuries in elbow will be, uh, sorry, in cyclists will be, uh, will be traumatic injuries. And uh, for those of you who've never been in the peloton, this is, this is actually what it looks like. It's a GoPro video. Um, you go through, uh, through the corner, basically a full gas, 180 uh, heart rate, and then someone crashes in front of you and that's it, you're on the floor. And you feel like, you feel really bad at that point. And especially this guy, if you look at his elbow, he already has a bloody bandage on it. So uh, that, that really doesn't feel good, although it looks, and it looks, Pretty bad, but it feels worse. Well, most of the injuries in cyclists in Belgium will not be a professional cyclists. Will be people like this who have a really, you know, an accident, or this guy who came back from a football match and had a few uh, had a few beers, and um, you know, it's not going to be too painful, but he might uh, be hurting tomorrow. So most of the elbow injuries will be fractures, and um, quite a few of them might be open elbow dislocations, and then uh, tendon injuries and. So far, I've not seen an acute uh, bicep tendon injury in a, in a bicycle in a, in a cyclist, but uh, we have seen a few triceps injuries. These are both the mechanisms that uh, Ali talked about as well. So, fall on the outstretched hand, and uh, the second uh, mechanism would be a direct impact, and uh, it's definitely not uncommon to find both in uh, in one picture. So, direct impact. If you do have a direct impact on your elbow, you're pretty likely to get an olecranon fracture. That's probably the most common fracture from a, from a direct impact. And that's one of the th uh, fractures that that's often open, or at least there might be a big scab wound on your, uh, um, on your elbow. This girl crashed, she's a, a predominantly um, a track cyclist, had this uh, relatively non-displaced uh, elbow fracture. But one of the things we talked about earlier when we were treating athletes is so when you treat athletes, the timing in the season is incredibly important. So um, if you can postpone treatment until after the season, then, uh, then you're good and, and just postpone and we'll see what happens. Obviously in cyclists, most of these injuries will happen mid season or during the season. So these need to be back on the bike as quickly as possible. And um, obviously, even though you may consider conservative treatment, I personally wouldn't, but if you would consider uh, uh, conservative treatment, you definitely would not, would not in a cyclist. Back then we used um, tension band, uh, it's, it's called the cable ready system, it's from uh, Zimmer. I have no interest in, in, uh, with that company, but uh, we used that because I thought that was the, uh, the entire solution to uh, being low profile. You get an incredible tension on the, uh, on the cable as, as a gripping system, but unfortunately it was almost impossible to take them out and it turned out they're not low profile, especially not in these cyclists because Cyclists have skin and bones that's, and muscles, that's it. They don't have uh, um, subcutaneous fat, at least not the professional ones, of course. They don't have subcutaneous fat and this needed to be removed because it's quite annoying for the patients and then it was almost impossible to remove. However, she did well. This is her uh, a few years later when she came for an unrelated injury on the other side. So we decided to take x-ray on both sides, uh, flexion extension, perfect uh, range of motion. And she actually still, uh, still active, was going to be uh, at least a candidate for Tokyo this year, but unfortunately uh, that got cancelled, of course. Professional cyclists, you see how skinny these guys are. Um, some of them are, uh, despite the fact that they are professional athletes, they might be a little osteoporotic, so their bone is not that strong, especially in the upper extremity. And um, clavicle fractures or, uh, or elbow fractures might be challenging to treat. And um, this is actually from his own uh, cell phone. He, he sent me this, uh, this image after he crashed. You see it's an open fracture. 
uh, some guy at the at the race put some stitches or put some uh, staples in, and uh, these are these are quite challenging. Not only because they're open, um, also because they're this, the bone is not that strong, and because he wants to be back in his bike tomorrow. So th those are real challenges. Um, this is a uh, synthes plate. Uh, they call it a cable. Sorry, they call it a tension band plate. Um, normally, you would not put an, uh, an extra screw proximal to the fracture. Uh, besides the home run screw, we use an extra screw to make sure we had some, some decent fixation so we would be able to get back on the bike uh, quickly. And uh, this is one of the ones that are still in place and he's never been a, uh, he's never been a candidate to remove this. <clears throat> this actual footage from the Tour de France, uh, not this year, but last year, or the year before, sorry. Um, Belgian cyclist, he crashes. Uh, he was in the lead group. See the scab wounds, luckily not open to the bone. This is an x-ray from the Tour de France. They have a portable x-ray machine. And then he came to Belgium the same day. We got a, a CT scan. You see that little fragment. And one of the challenges in his case was that six weeks later, he needed to be at the, at the World Championships. And uh, a famous cycling coach said, well, he, he would better, be better off to go to church and pray instead of going to Antwerp for, for a surgery because there's no way he's going to make it. And uh, so I made a bet if you make it, I'll drive to Austria and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see the race. So we did, he made it, we drove to Austria, about a thousand kilometers there. Um, unfortunately he had the stomach upset. So uh, after two laps, he had to uh, retire and then uh, we drove back, but he made it. So uh, we're still friends. Second mechanism, a fall on the outstretched hand. Um, these are the things that can happen. Radial head fractures, uh, obviously very, very common. Dislocation, terrible triad and triceps and in fact, uh, Ali already uh, talked about this, but the professional cyclists really like to hold on to their, uh, to their handlebars. So although radial head fractures are very common in the general population and general cyclists, they're not that common in, um, in uh, professional cyclists. And maybe Kevin can talk about that, but I personally have not seen one uh, that needed to be operated in a professional cyclist. Isolated radial head fractures, that is. Type one, treatment is easy, it's non-displaced, conservative treatment, aspirate joint, put in a, a bit of local anesthetic if you want to, although it's uh, something that I don't, I don't prefer. I told you I had two radial hand fractures, uh, but they were a couple of years apart. And on one side, I had an aspiration and a local anesthetic. And on the other side, a couple of years later, I asked, uh, back then was Dr. Morio, because I was at Mayo at the time. I asked him, please don't put any local anesthetic in because it helps for a while, for maybe 30 minutes. But the volume of the local anesthetic is, is, or the volume of the fluid inside the joint, that's what hurts. What hurts. So, um, so we steer away from that. Type two, displaced fracture osteosynthesis, and type three, like I said, is very rare in professional cyclists. Luckily, luckily. This may be a reason to operate on a type one radial head fracture. This uh, patient uh, always check the passive range of motion for flexion and extension. Uh, and uh, obviously flexion, uh, pronation and supination. Flexion and extension will be decreased, will be painful, uh, but not necessarily blocked, whereas rotation usually is not that painful, especially not in the non-displaced one. So you get them to sit with their uh, elbow flex 90 degrees at the side, and then you, uh, you know, very gently uh, grab the hand and rotate flex, uh, in pro-supination. And generally, you'll be able to do so. There may be a bit of, little bit of apprehension, but generally the patient should be okay. However, in some patients, there's a block. There's a true block to, look, to rotation. And if that's the case, they, um, uh, we tend to uh, inject, uh, aspirate, inject with local anesthetic, test them again after 10, 15 minutes. And then um, if it's still blocked, then they need surgery. And we prefer to do this arthroscopically. This is an open fixation of a real-life fracture. You see the displacement. We just uh, reduced the fracture. And I've uh, shortened the video because that's not the, the um, subject of this talk. But, Reduce the rail head fracture, put a screw, one or two screws in, and you're able to do this with a very limited exposure. And uh, uh, these patients are back on the bike the day after because the, the screw is, is strong enough. It's, uh, it's really not going to displace, and um, uh, I'm happy to uh, send them back quickly. Slightly more difficult, this one. Um, you see, again, a block to rotation, but unfortunately, quite a few pieces, and uh, some of the pieces. I thought maybe we're not fixable, but luckily we were able to do so with a low profile fixation, because again, if you use a plate, which is possible in these cases, but if you use a plate, you need a bigger incision, you need a bigger exposure and um, they will lose some rotation and, and the plate generally needs to come out, which is something that we prefer not to do, obviously, 
So if you can do this in a low profile fixation, these people, again, test the stability during the case and the back in the bike quickly. Um, if you can't fix it, some patients you really can't fix. Too many pieces, too much comminution. And um, like I said, that's extremely rare in professional, but obviously happens in, um, in general cyclist, which uh, Belgium is full of, of course. Well, if so, then you need to replace them. And it's always a little bit sad because these patients are uh, in their 20s usually. And um, if you do replace them, then um, the elbow is never going to be the same. It might be good. It might be excellent even, but it's never going to be exactly the same. And um, especially in cyclists, you want them to be able to hold on to the handlebars to pull and push, etc. Elbow dislocations, that's something that we see... Um, uh, not necessarily every month, but still relatively regularly in cyclists, uh, also in the, in the professional, semi-professionals. Uh, this is a MRI of this same patient, brachialis tear. So this, that indicates a hyperextension trauma. Luckily for him, no uh, fracture. And um, it, a hyperextension trauma like this is only possible without a fracture if you dislocate. So uh, lateral collateral ligament torn, uh, medial collateral ligament uh, uh, at least uh, partially torn. We tested him and he, uh, he seemed to be stable. So we decided not to operate on this, uh, on this patient because cyclists, it uh, maybe sounds a bit weird, but they, they don't need various valgus stability. And he was at that point, he was not uh, in, the, in the position to be operated on. He was one of the ones that we decided to postpone till after uh, the season. And luckily for him, he didn't need it. And he's, uh, he's still happily uh, riding along. His next patient is a mountain bike injury. That's, this is not him. This is just a picture from the internet because he wasn't filmed when he was doing it. He was actually a relatively a little bit embarrassed because he was jumping over, the, um, uh, over a couple of uh, logs like he saw on TV, obviously. And uh, the first log was fine, but the second log, log, he hit it, put out his outstretched hand, fell on it, and then dislocated his elbow. You see positive uh, pivot shift sign. Uh, really a lot of opening on various valgus there. And then obviously we didn't disturb the LCL at all yet. I just did my uh, normal incision over the radial head, over the lateral condyle and um, um, uh, extensive tendon split. And this is the LCL complex, which is torn off. When you read about elbow dislocations, you always read about the LUCL, the lateral collateral ligament, but it can't tear without the radial collateral ligament. So various valgus instability will be there as well. And, Mountain biking is a different uh, animal than uh, road racing. So mountain bikers need more stability. And uh, I discussed with him the uh, option of uh, conservative treatment, of course, and uh, he still decided to have surgery because he said, I want to be you know, sure that it's gonna be stable because when you do conservative treatment in professional athletes, it's always a little bit uh, uh, tricky because they might end up with a large, long rehab and then end up with a poor result and secondary surgery is more difficult, of course. I found this on the internet as well. The Yankee is definitely my favorite bike. And uh, that's why I, I chose to use this for the terrible triad. Terrible triad, as you know, is a rail head fracture, a coronoid fracture, and disruption of at least one of the lateral collateral ligaments and uh, generally both. This is a semi-professional cyclist. He fell, had a rail head fracture, it's not too bad. A coronoid fracture, you can discuss about uh, the type of this. Is it between type one and type two, but you can see that the elbow is dislocated. So an elbow dislocated like this without stress. So he's in the MRI, it's not even extended, needs surgery. Like I said, we, we prefer to do this with, uh, with the minimalistic uh, technique um, or minimalistic uh, repair. As long as they're stable and on the table, I'm happy and I'll keep adding hardware if necessary, if we, if we feel that we can't uh, let these guys go straight away. Uh, what you don't see on this x-ray is this ligament uh, injury and a radial collateral ligament injury or radial collateral complex li ligament injury and medial side, which uh, healed. But uh, on the medial side, he had a little bit of uh, calcification. So his flexion extension is not perfect. He has uh, enough extension because he worked really hard on that, but he's a little bit limited in flexion. And maybe secondary will have to do something about that. This is what the Bianchis look like now. Uh, don't look at all like the one I had, except for the color. The color has to be this one, potentially with some black accents, but uh, this is a true Bianchi bike like it should be. Again, a professional cyclist, tricep structure, um, 
big piece of meat there at the back. He ruptured it completely just by crashing, uh, falling on his outstretched hand. Uh, we do a perc uh, sorry, a transosseous uh, suture fixation. Again, the video is a little bit uh, quick because you know there's so much ground to cover in these uh, in this presentation that um, I decided just to make quick videos so you can actually see what we do. If you need more detail, then uh, then contact us, or I'm sure there'll be another webinar on uh, on another topic somewhere. This is another uh, kind of cyclist you can see from his arm. This looks like a, a professional cyclist would have uh, legs like this. Uh, this guy came out of the bar and uh, crashed and then hurt himself on the on the tram rails. So that was an open uh, rupture. It wasn't it wasn't our uh, incision. We just didn't extend it a little bit. This is him six weeks later. He's very happy, and uh, I'm sure he's back on the bike as well. Um, unfortunately, the bars are closed, obviously, but he's uh, he's happy with that. So some specific points when we're talking about uh, cyclists and some of the points that I learned uh, on the way, because I thought, you know, after uh, I, I used to be a cyclist, I thought I knew a little bit about it, but, uh, but there's still some specific points that I, that I really didn't consider that much. First of all is loading. When you're on the bike, you're loading your elbow all the time, literally all the time. Uh, maybe not as, not as hard as now because this is cobblestones, and uh, Gerd van Avermaet is going uphill. So he's both pulling and pushing at the same time, uh, pulling on one side, pushing on the other side, and the cobblestones are really hurting your, uh, your arms. So you need a perfect elbow or at least a decent elbow to be able to do this. There are often bad roads, not necessarily as bad as this in Paris-Roupé, but uh, definitely potholes, uh, tram rails, things you need to worry about. And when you're on your bike for five, six hours at a time, you can't be concentrated the whole time. So every once in a while, one of those potholes hit you and hurt you a little bit. So loading is a big thing. Uphill, I already talked about that. Um, you're pushing and really pushing on your, uh, on your arms very hard and most of the load will go through your elbow. And then sprinting, uh, not for the recreational cyclist maybe, but sprinting again, look at the, uh, not only his legs are working, his arms are definitely working. And you know that every time that you're, that you're making a fist, you're pushing your radial head against your capitellum, and this guy is making a very, very tight fist um, while moving his elbow. So it's like a, an extreme grip and grind test that he's doing. So when you're thinking about uh, elbow injuries or when you're treating elbow injuries, I think the bony stability is extremely important. Like I said, varus valgus may be less important, uh, but the bony uh, uh, stability is extremely important. So even minor uh, coronoid fractures Maybe maybe quite important and maybe warrant fixation, be it arthroscopic or open, um, but if necessary, fix them. Uh, same with rail head fractures, but like I said, relatively uncommon in a professional cyclist, very common in recreational cyclists. But with those, the challenges I mean, are, are less. The challenges in recreational cyclists are actually quite easy because you just tell them to stay off the bike for six weeks and, and once it's healed, they're happy to let them go. And then something that uh, I'm sure Kevin has, uh, has uh, worked on with, uh, with his uh, population of, uh, of cyclists, but the elbow position is something that that's, um, warrants a lot of attention. And um, what I didn't realize, so you have flexion. If you can flex to 90, maybe 100 degrees, you can be a professional cyclist. That's fine. You don't need to, uh, uh, to flex more unless you want to drink, of course, but you have two hands. So if you just want to ride your bike, you can do that with relatively limited flexion, so there's not a lot you need to do about that during the season. However, extension is extremely important, and extension is something that I realized later on, but um, um, you saw all the other pictures of those professional guys, they're flexed. Most of the time they're flexed, but all of those pictures are in full, uh, in full uh, beast mode. So they're pushing, they're pulling, and they, that's when you flex your elbow. However, most of the race or most of the training, you're sitting like this, and you're relaxed and you can be most relaxed when you all but lock your, maybe the elbow's locked or maybe the elbow's almost locked, but it needs extension. It needs nearly full extension to be comfortable on your bike. So in conclusion, elbow injuries in cyclists, um, traumatic, they're, they're, let's say almost exclusively traumatic. They often have poor bone. So despite the fact that these are young people, the bone quality might be a little bit decreased. And uh, they will have poor tissue coverage because uh, it might be uh, damaged from the fall, but they don't have a lot of uh, fatty tissue. They don't have big, uh, a lot of subcutaneous tissue. So it's, it's uh, skin and bones, 
with uh, with elbows at least. And result wise, you need to think really concentrate on two things. Are they allowed to have actual to do perform actual loading because that's what they need and work on the extension as quickly as possible because they need extension and strength in loading that's those are the two things that you really need to work uh, specifically need to work on with the cyclists when you compare these to other athletes. Thank you. Great talk, Roger. Fantastic. Um, should we should we carry on and then you can look at some questions and we'll take the questions in the end, Ali? Yeah. I think it's a good idea. Thank yeah. you. Okay. I'll 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 share my screen and I'll do my presentation now. Uh, uh, if I may ask the participants if they have any questions, they can put them in the Q and A so we can collect them and answer them for you in the end. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay. Um, yeah, no, yeah. For those of you who joined late, uh, my name is Jagwan Singh. I'm one of the upper limb surgeons in the group. And my NHS practice is at Lewisham and Greenwich NHS Trust. Uh, these are my affiliations. So uh, my colleague Ali Nurani has talked about shoulder injuries, the ACJ, the clavicle fractures. I'll be talking about high energy injuries involving the cyclists, such as collision, high impact, dive force, and when, especially landing with a heavy force uh, and when the humeral head impacts on the scapular neck. Um, so most of these injuries are in predominantly male age group, 25 to 50 years. Most of these involve the scapular body and uh, also the glenoid process that is the socket. So when we talk about glenoid fractures, they could be ranging from rim fractures to fractures involving the body of the scapula uh, and comminuted fractures um, extending up to the medial end. Now, when we have a glenoid fracture in association with the same side clavicle fractures, we talked about the suspensory mechanism where the arm is hanging to the axial skeleton. The scapula with its 18 muscles and attachments um, plays an important role in the shoulder suspensory complex. And when we have an injury of um, the glenoid and the clavicle or the associated ligaments, that is disruption of this shoulder suspensory complex. And that is a condition on a floating shoulder. These are high energy injuries. And we have to be mindful of other injuries like rib fractures, lung injuries, and any life-threatening injuries. So this is the shoulder suspensory complex, which is a ring of you know, bony and soft tissue. That is the ligaments, acromoclavicular, coracoclavicular ligaments, the clavicle and the base of the scapular neck. These could be disrupted in different ways. And when this happens, the scapula, um, the arm suspensory mechanism is involved. And that is one of the injuries which leads to an unstable shoulder girdle and is an indication for surgical treatment. Uh, also, the other indications would be an open fracture, uh, a glenoid articular fracture, where there is a big step and you would like to restore the articular congruency. Glenoid fractures, which will involve the rim, can lead to instability, and that is also an indication to fix these fractures. Fractures which have involvement of the lateral column, which is displaced, angular deformities, uh, again, these are indications wherein an operation is needed. I would like to discuss a case of my own. Um, he's a cyclist, had a very high speed collision accident, 36 years old. Uh, he works in our trust in the, in the catering unit, manual job. And as we can see here, um, he's fractured his clavicle. So he's fractured his clavicle, and then he's also fractured his glenoid. 
the scapular neck extending into the body of the scapula on up to the medial end. So again, a complex injury. The first important thing in these injuries is to assess the patient for any life-threatening injuries, like if there is a lung parenchymal injury, a tension pneumothorax. Once that has been done in accident and emergency, then we can plan the surgical um, intervention. Um, in this case, we have a clavicle fracture which needs to be fixed. We have a glenoid fracture. Again, we need to restore the um, glenohumeral articulation. And then we have to restore the lateral and the medial column of the scapula, which is important uh, because there are lots of muscles, especially the rotator cuff and their arms and their function um, has an impact if the, if the scapula is not fully restored. The decision-making in this case, case was easy. We can see it clearly the glenoid fracture displaced and there's subluxation of the humeral head. This has to be restored in a young person. So um, we did a two-stage operation. The first stage was fixing the clavicle fracture done in a beat chair position. And then a week later, we did the fixation of the, of the scapula. Uh, this is done on a lateral position, a Jude approach where uh, we make a flap and then deltoid is taken off. We go into the plane between the infraspinatus and teres minor, uh, keeping the axillary nerve and the neurovascular bundle of the infraspinatus protected. We then expose the glenoid and reduce the glenoid, fix it, that's the most important step, and then uh, fix the uh, medial and the lateral column of the, of the um, scapula. So the most important thing is the restoration of the glenoid articular surface. So, and then followed by the uh, medial and lateral column restoration of the scapula. This is his x-ray at three months. Um, we've got bony union. The wounds have healed nicely. It's got good function. Um, arms up, 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 up. And Very thanks nice. to my Trump physiotherapist. Trump. These are all complex injuries and um, young people, cyclists, they want to go back to cycling. And um, it is a teamwork and it involves one or two stage operation which has to be uh, properly planned. Uh, again, um, young people like to go back to cycling as soon as possible and gaining the, the uh, good outcome for them is the priority here. Thank you. So I'll, I'll introduce my, our next speaker now uh, is Kevin Kupens. He works at the University of Antwerp. Um, he has, he's a specialist shoulder physiotherapist and also has got interest in uh, performance-related chronic shoulder pain. Uh, he likes, uh, he's involved in education and uh, teaches on numerous courses. He's also involved in multiple research groups. Um, and I would hand over to Kevin, to you now. Jag, you may have to stop sharing. Okay. Great. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for this uh, fine introduction and, and for the invitation for uh, having me this evening. So if everything goes well, you will see my first slide. Yes, we can see. Fantastic. Okay, perfect. So I'm um, happy to be here. I will be talking about the cyclist shoulder, but maybe we can uh, expand the title a little bit towards the cyclist's upper limb and that a little bit more from a physiotherapist uh, point of view. Um, so I, as you can see here, this is a bit of my my uh, personal timeline. I, I have a background in swimming, being a swimmer, not the swimmer. He is he's one of our elite current swimmers in Belgium. Um, but I have had uh, some swimming experience myself, both within the pool and beside the pool as a physiotherapist for the national team. Um, I have had some time writing my PhD on the chronic performance uh, related shoulder pain. And on the right-hand side, you see my, my oldest boy, uh, who is 
here representing a bit of my future, I think, uh, which, which is more related to cycling. Um, so my own experience in cycling, both from a research point of view and from a practical point of view, clinical point of view, uh, is, is more or less in its young, young ages. So, um, for example, I, I have no bike fitting skills at all, but I tend to look at uh, the cyclists as I look at, at other sports people uh, going uh, uh, from out the position of the athletes. So what I would like to discuss with you today is first of all, the role of the shoulder in cycling. And uh, we, we have had fantastic talks about the surgical possibilities, but I think the role of the shoulder um, kind of defines the goals we have to aim for uh, in our clinical management and our uh, both surgical and uh, physio management. So I think there is a role for the shoulder to win races, to support the machine. And by the machine, I refer to the combination of the bike and the cyclist. Uh, and maybe there is also a role to prevent injuries. And I, I have to start saying that the, the literature, the research on the role of the shoulder in cycling is a bit sparse. So, so um, we have some literature, which I will refer to, um, but we also refer to some personal experiences. So at first, some uh, direct actions in the shoulder to win races. You see here a beautiful picture of Victor Kampenaerts. Uh, I have had the pleasure to uh, work with Victor in the past five, six years, I think. Um, as some of you might know, he is the, the current uh, UCI World Hour record holder. Um, and when I asked him what is the role of the shoulder in, in for you as a cyclist, well, he stated that the optimal control of my shoulders significantly reduced my frontal area. So it is from an aerodynamic point of view, a really important region uh, to take care for. And this next two pictures, uh, I think they, they summarize uh, some of the aspects. So you see here that Victor has done his, 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 his record race last year uh, in a position about 110 degrees of, of shoulder flexion in a horizontal a deduction and a neutral rotation at the level of the shoulder um, so and I, I kindly invite you all to take this position so 100 degrees 110 degrees of shoulder flexion horizontal a deduction and neutral rotation and, and keep this position uh, for the for the next duration of my talk um, another way in, in which we have seen that well at least from my perspective the shoulder as a direct link in winning races is, is here the difference between the winner Mathieu van der Poel and the second uh, in, in, the, in the last Tour of Flanders uh, last October. You see here that, that there is a massive amount of shoulder flexion that's fast reactive, that's strong. It, it, it actually looks a bit like a shoulder press. So um, again, in, in this situation, I think there is a direct role for the shoulder in winning races. But as I have stated, there is probably also a role for the shoulder in supporting the machine. So making sure that the cyclist is capable of pushing as hard as possible or as long as possible on the cranks, on the pedals. And I have made uh, this slide and, and probably the arrows are from a biomechanical point of view, not uh, completely accurate, but it is actually by pulling on the handlebar that the cyclists at a, uh, let's say a sub maximal level, so in an endurance level, that he is able to remain seated. So it is by pulling on the handlebar, which is actually, uh, been shown in research that, that the, the biceps, the brachioradialis and the deltoid muscles, they are active uh, in, in this uh, 
pulling on the handlebar and it's related to the stabilization of the trunk in a vertical ray. So the, the center of mass of the whole body is maintained at a constant vertical level just by pulling on the handlebar. And that creates a uh, stable position of the body in order to reach the most optimal uh, crank power outputs. Um, so this way you, sh you see that, that uh, by pulling on the handlebar, uh, which actually uh, needs a, a lot of uh, activity, both in the shoulder and the elbow, I think, um, is, is really helpful in supporting the machine. Um, as you know, uh, cycling is kind of an, an alternating left right leg force sport. So during cycling, you, you, you create alternating forces on the left and the right uh, legs. And these alternating forces, they destabilize the trunk. So they destabilize the position of the trunk. And part of this destabilization forces, motions, they are absorbed by the arms. And that's also uh, accurately measured in, in a beautiful paper by the group of Turpin et al. So this way you see that the shoulder um, has a role in stabilizing the lateral movements uh, coming from out the legs, but uh, eventually destabilizing the trunk a little bit. May there be some role for the shoulder in preventing injuries, maybe preventing some of these acute traumatic injuries. Well, as you see here, this this uh, guy is trying to keep his core as stable as possible, not only his core, but also uh, both legs and both arms. And you see that in, in trying to maintain this absolute stability, this rigid position, he actually is not able to respond on kind of the dancing movement of the bike over the stones as you see here. So the result is that he cannot react accurately. And in the next slide, you see this is a more experienced mountain bike uh, athlete. And, and I refer to this as core ordination. So he is not absolutely stabilizing his body. He's not uh, creating a, a rigid position of the body, but he is actually, well, dancing with his bike on the stones as you see here. So both the elbows and the shoulders are, well, we, we, we may not say that they are relaxed, but they are dynamically active. They are reacting on uh, the actions of the bike on uh, the, the difficult surfaces in this matter. So it, it is my idea that whenever, as, as in, in this way, a mountain bike specialist is able to present with such a beautiful core ordination, um, he helps himself in, in preventing injuries. So obviously in, during, during the former presentations, it is clear that shoulder problems do happen in cycling. And I, I just want to refer to two expert opinions. So we have two athletes and the first is Elke van Hoof. She's a Belgian uh, professional and an Olympic uh, BMX finalist. She's a European several times European medalist. Um, she has had her part of uh, traumatic injuries followed by several surgeries. And she stated that um, lots of these situations were then followed by overuse complaints, may probably not say overuse injuries, but overuse complaints in the upper limb. And the second athlete I want to refer to, this is Jan Bakelans. He, he is a, a professional road cyclist. He, he once uh, had the yellow jersey in the Tour de France for several stages. Um, when I have asked Jan about uh, shoulder and probably also neck complaints during his career, well, he said that these, these shoulder and neck muscles, they are often painful, they are often a bit sore, and it is related to pulling on the handlebar. Um, and actually he stated that, that these shoulder and neck muscles are practically always an indication during his recovery massages. So whenever he goes to a massage therapist, he asks for uh, uh, 
doing a massage on the shoulder and neck muscles. And um, Jan also stated that these sore muscles in, in the shoulder and neck region, they, they become a bit more prominent after a collision or after surgery. And it, it was his opinion that one of the main reasons is that there is not too much of a focus uh, on the post-operative care or the post-collision care probably um, related to the region of the shoulder and neck muscles. Um, and then maybe we have to ask ourselves what about the overuse injuries in road cycling? Well, whenever we look at the literature, um, we might end up concluding that shoulder overuse injuries, they don't happen in cycling. Um, and probably it is because the symptoms, those shoulder overuse symptoms, they do not hamper the performance. And, and that's beautifully described by uh, Caroline Bolling and her colleagues in, in, in a paper uh, presented in 2018, in which they asked several athletes about how or when they perceive uh, certain symptoms as an injury. And it is clear that athletes uh, only define symptoms as an injury whenever it hampers performance. And I, I have highlighted two boxes in, in this slide. You see probably lots of the cyclists suffering from some aches and pains in the shoulder region. They don't see it as hampering the performance, so it's not an injury. And even if they see it as hampering performance and thereby seeing it as an injury, they will probably uh, still be able to participate uh, both in training and competition. And often that's like the cutoff point in research for defining whether or not an injury occurs. Um, and, and we know from research and that's some of my own research I've, I've done that especially endurance athletes, they are really good in, in pain coping and they have quite high pain tolerance levels. So these, these endurance athletes, they are really good at, at pain suffering, um, probably because they have had some psychological and maybe physiological non-specific training effects on their, well, let's say more related to the, 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 pain, uh, the pain system. So we should ask ourselves what's next. Uh, and, and I think probably this is uh, the most important slide in my presentation um, that we do not have to take the cyclist shoulder as a problem because probably the athletes also don't see it as a problem um, especially the overuse cycling shoulder but as we have seen the the traumatic uh, injuries they 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 end up doing really well so we don't have to definitely see it as a problem, but more or less as an opportunity to uh, probably be a bit better in rehab, maybe in prevention and also in performance. And I have kind of summarized it in this slide. You see here, uh, take the cyclist shoulder as an opportunity to implement the current knowledge, sparse current knowledge uh, about the role of the shoulder in performance, in rehab, and maybe also in prevention. So try to add some aspects of lateral stability, vertical stability, aerodynamics, the core ordination, so the kind of the reactivity, the dancing possibilities of the shoulder on the bike, try to implement that in the training and uh, or in the rehab. So you see here, this is uh, one of the pictures uh, we have made for Victor in order to, to support him doing his exercises. And this actually is an exercise in which he, he tries and learns to, to take uh, a cycling specific position for a long time um, in a situation uh, outside of the bike. Um, you see here the same athletes, uh, who copes very well with these kind of exercises. So he, he, he puts his arms uh, more or less on a stable position and then does a flexion extension movement with the legs. But obviously this is kind of a hard 
core exercise, but within this core, we also have to highlight the impact, the necessity of, of activating really well the shoulder region. So um, at the end of my talk, again, I want to refer to take uh, the cyclist shoulder as an opportunity also to think beyond the line of current knowledge, both in training, both in rehab, but also in research. And I promise you that we will do some more research about uh, the role of the shoulder and maybe uh, some, some rehab aspects uh, concerning uh, the implementation of, of more specific elements in uh, rehab in training of, of cyclists. And we, we are already doing that in our clinical practice. This is my colleague who is doing some experiments with some of the previously described aspects from vertical stability, lateral stability. Um, and, and I think all of the physical therapists attending today, um, they can work from out their own imagination to, to go ahead with uh, with, with some of these maybe more or less theoretical aspects. Thank you and also thank you for all, for all the, the, the athletes and, and colleague trainers and coaches that uh, have made this presentation possible. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. That was an excellent talk. Uh, do you mind if I ask you a quick question about your thoughts on uh, whether in cyclists particularly, um, whether there is a um, f more role than normal population of fixing certain injuries. So what, what that mean is that if you have a clav clavicle fracture or an ACJ disruption, do you think that a cyclist will suffer more um, unless there is an anatomical reconstruction? Or, or do you think that in some cases they tolerate conservative treatment as well as the normal population? Well, that's a good question. I don't think we, we, we have the knowledge, but um, from my sparse experience with it, um, um, and, and that's probably not in, in, the, in the elite group, but more in the recreational uh, cyclists, um, we see that those who have not had an anatomical repair, they end up with, with kind of uh, an, an asymmetry uh, at the shoulder level, and I'm I'm absolutely not allergic to to asymmetry, so a little bit of asymmetry, no no problem. Um, but I think when we talk about the kinetic chain, uh, and and actually in cycling, I think we have to talk about the kinetic chain. Uh, there might be an impact of significant asymmetry in the upper quadrant that can relate to overuse injuries on time, uh, probably more or less in the lower quadrant. Um, don't know if they suffer more from their shoulder um, because uh, maybe the, the, the total load on the shoulder is probably not that high, but we need the shoulder to be able to, to produce the optimal forces uh, with the rest of the body. Uh, great talk, Kevin. Uh, just a, a question. What advice do you give to cyclists who get trapezial spasm? Is there anything specific to prevent it? Uh, probably the, the bike fitters in the room, they will have some, some good answers. Um, well, I, I, from my perspective, I think um, we, we can refer the, the role of the shoulder a little bit as you, you are kind of hanging in a hammock. So you, you, you may want to create a really stable hammock completely around the shoulder girdle, also uh, involving the, 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 like the serratus muscle, the protracting muscles, um, just making sure that, that it's not only, for example, the upper traps that, that's, that have to be dominant in this position. So make sure the complete shoulder girdle is, is, uh, is accurately uh, stable and strong. Um, and 
added to this probably some some bike fitting related uh, uh, position changes might also help. Great, thank you. Thank Is you very much. Else, great. So I'm gonna call it the close of the session. Do you mind, if, Jack? I'll um, ask uh, Roger one more question, if I may. Something that's uh, interesting about whether you have any particular um, restrictions in your uh, post of rehab for your elbows. You see, when I do shoulders, um, I tend to provide um, absolute stability as much as I can. But when I do ACJ reconstructions um, and I do or clavicle fracture fixations. So I've gone away from holding them back and mobilizing them fairly rapidly. Uh, but I still tend to avoid end range movements in the first three or four weeks, right? So, you know, hand behind the back, cross arm aid deduction, uh, that puts a lot of torsional force around the uh, clavicle and the ACJ. Um, so is there anything in particular that when you address those various elbow injuries that you have in cycling, that you particularly restrict them from doing and so on in the early post-op period. Yeah, thank you, Ali. That's um, you know I talked about the bony stability a lot during my during my talk, and I think uh, first of all during the surgery we try to get bony stability in the elbow. The ligamentous stability, um, obviously, we'll we'll repair an LCL if necessary, um, but I don't really um, like you do. Uh, I don't really protect them uh, that much. So basically, I tell them to be back on the bike the day after if they can. And believe it or not, but the, the thing I'm most worried about is they're sweating, because they're sweating. You know, but they they don't go on the out, they don't go outside straight away. They go indoors. I'll, I'll 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 share my screen again. So they go indoors, and indoor cycling is really sweaty. And um, this is uh, see if I can. Yeah. So this is literally two days post op, and uh, even though he's not wearing that many clothes, but. You know, this is this is worrying to me how he uh, how he's um, basically pressing his uh, his, uh, his scar and his, his wound. But um, so post op rehab or post op restrictions, not really. But wound care is extremely important in, in those uh, athletes. So uh, he's uh, he has his wound protected now. I tell him after the training to make sure that you take off the bandage as soon as possible, disinfect it again, use some betadine, and really keep a very close eye on the wound. And uh, you know, after a week or so, we're we're happy. But the first week, that's that's the main restriction: is the wound. It's not necessarily the uh, the repair or the or the fracture. This was a plate. Um, you can see he can't extend fully yet, but he's uh, he's happy to be back on the bike, and he's uh, he's not focusing on his elbow. He's focused on uh, on his screen, where he can see how many watts he's pushing and how uh, you know what his heart rate is. And that's that's very important, I think, in these guys. It's actually quite interesting that uh, so I have the same thoughts as well. So. Um, return to activity is all about them sweating and I worry about the wound getting infected more than anything else. Yeah, um, interesting. Um, Jack, do you have any other comments or Kevin, do you have any other comments before we close off? No, I think we've been answering all this on the chat, um, but today we had a very nice session and I hope all the um, attendees have benefited. They would like to see the uh, recording of it, which will be on the website soon. Um, I think in a day or so. Um, and that's it. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And thank you all to all the speakers. Pleasure, guys. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.